Hi class, welcome to our second video in this module where you're going to be learning about cognitive development in middle and late childhood. So what will you be learning about in this video? You're going to be learning about Piaget's stage of concrete operational thinking and the characteristics of this stage. You're also going to be learning about the research on memory and attention and metacognition and critical thinking during middle and late childhood. You'll also learn about language development and the three types of communication disorders. You'll learn too about the theories of intelligence, including general or G intelligence and triarchic theory. And you'll learn about Gardner's multiple intelligences. You'll learn how to, or how intelligence is measured. And you'll learn about the different types of tests that are used. And you'll learn too about the extremes in intelligence and the concern of bias. You'll also learn about how language and culture influence the typical classroom. And you're also going to be learning about some of the common disabilities in childhood and the legislation that protects them educationally. So let's get started.
if you look at table 5-2, you'll see the percent of children who did not use any memory strategies by age. So you'll see that at age 6, 55% are in this study not using memory strategies, but then by the age of 10, 13% are not. So we see this gradual progression year by year of an increasing um, percent of children who are using memory strategies. During middle and late childhood, we see quite a bit of language development. In particular, we see that children on average know around 40,000 words by age nine. And there are also new understandings of words that include categories and the use of objects and a less literal interpretation of meaning. We also see better grammar. The U.S. Department of Education suggests that learning more than one language is an asset to individuals, to families, and to our entire society. And many researchers encourage parents to consider adding a bilingual approach to their child's education for many reasons that we'll be exploring and that you've read about in your textbook. One misconception is that it may confuse a growing child during the early education stage to learn a second language. It's easy to understand um, the basis for these concerns, but if we look at what the research has to say, um, this is not correct, and the exact opposite is actually true. Bilingual children learn better and faster than other children. A great benefit to bilingualism is, that, is one that parents often see in their own child, and that involves cognitive development. So children who, especially those who learn a second language very early in their lives, prior to the age of six, and this is not to suggest that these benefits don't carry on or that we wouldn't see some of these benefits in middle childhood, but early learning can be tremendously helpful in many areas. So for example, um, it helps to it will help children to have an easier time understanding math concepts and solving word problems, developing strong thinking skills and using logic. It can also help children to have better focus, to remember better, and it can also be helpful in decision making and thinking about language and then learning additional languages beyond that second language. As children who are living in families who are not English speaking or who have very minimal English, uh, these children as they come to school can uh, you know, benefit tremendously from learning English that goes well beyond the cognitive benefits. Uh, children who learn English at school or through other means uh, are able to make new friends and to create strong relationships using that second language. Also, those children who, whose native language is English and who learn a second language, this provides them with opportunities to develop friendships with children that they might otherwise not be able to develop friendships with. Perhaps a child is learning as a second language Spanish, and now they're able to communicate with another child whose native language is Spanish. So we can think about how this language development and these opportunities to learn a second language can really help to create ties within schools and communities. I think it's important to note as well that when children are in school and they are learning a second language, especially um, when we think about children whose parents do not speak English, Sometimes parents who do not speak English can feel very removed from what's going on in the classroom. You could imagine yourself, if you were to live in a different country and you didn't know the language and your child was attending a school that was spoken in that country's language, how removed you might feel. And even as you're trying to learn that language, you still might not know it very well, especially in the beginning. So many teachers um, will send home communication to parents in that parent's language. Now, this is not to suggest that teachers need to know how to speak all of these different languages that could possibly be spoken at the homes of children that they teach, but we could think about the benefits of children who are, um, or of 
you know, of translation services or just translation programs that are available for free online. And so teachers can put in their communication in English and then it can come out uh, in whatever language they want it to. Granted, it's not perfect, but it's certainly uh, a, a great way for parents and teachers to have communication. Let's now take some time to review the communication disorders that you learned about as you were in this chapter. Let's first take a look at fluency disorders. So childhood onset fluency disorders, they are communication disorders characterized by a disturbance in the flow and timing of speech that's inappropriate for an individual's age. This can sometimes be referred to as stuttering, and it includes the repetition or prolongation of speech sounds. It can include hesitations before and during speaking, long pauses in speech, effortful speech, and monosyllabic whole word repetitions. This is commonly accompanied by anxiety about speaking and can place limitations on how comfortable a child feels participating in social and academic environments. The symptoms of this disorder typically develop between the ages of two and seven, with most developing by age six. And these disorders become even more apparent as we move into middle childhood. So while mild stuttering is common in children who are learning to speak, this behavior becomes a fluency disorder when it persists over time and causes distress in the child. And as you've read, Stuttering is more commonly found among males than it is among females. So what are some of the symptoms of this, um, this type of disorder? Well, there's, as I've mentioned, a repetition of syllables, sounds, or monosyllabic words like I, I, I see them. There's prolonging the vocalization of consonants and vowels, broken words like pauses within a word, filled or unfulfilled pauses in speech word substitution to avoid problematic words, and words produced with an excess of physical tension. This might include fist clenching or head jerking, and there may be some frustration or embarrassment that's related to speech. You might have wondered what it is that causes this type of disorder. So research has shown that stuttering and some of the other communication difficulties tend to run in families. So in other words, there seems to be a genetic component and stuttering can also appear or worsen in situations that can cause distress, like feeling nervous or feeling pressured. Another disorder is articulation disorder. And this is the inability to correctly produce phonemes. And if you'll remember from earlier chapters, phonemes are individual units of sound. So a child with articulation disorder uh, may have some errors in speech sounds by mispronouncing or substituting or leaving out a sound. And it's age appropriate for children at certain ages to be producing some kind of errors with particular sounds. But articulation disorders can impact a child's speech intelligibility while communicating with others. So, um, you know, as you would imagine, then articulation disorders are related to an individual's ability to say particular sounds or string sounds together. And at the most basic level, they're the result of the person being physiologically unable to produce particular sounds, perhaps through the use of their lips or their teeth, their tongue or palate, or even their respiratory system or facial nerves or muscles. Uh, this, disorder, this type of disorder uh, in children who have no associated condition can be treatable with speech therapy. And in, uh, in children who have trouble articulating because of another condition, the prognosis of that condition likely will affect their progress in correcting their articulation disorder. Children who have articulation disorder uh, may vary in the type of uh, symptoms that they have. So some children may have, um, you know, they may produce or pronounce extra syllables or extra sounds. So instead of saying assembly, they might say assembly. Sometimes children who have this disorder um, might substitute one sound for another. So they might pronounce a W like a W instead of a R. 
And then sometimes children with this disorder may have distortions uh, where the person, you know, that child tries uh, to pronounce a sound correctly, but ends up actually distorting the sound. So they might work really hard to produce a W or W sound and produce a whistling sound instead. Voice disorders are pretty common in children. About 5% of children experience this, um, you know, a chronic or long lasting voice disorder. It's, um, it's a voice disorder is when the quality of a, of a child's voice is noticeably different to the voices of others who are in the same age range or sex. And children with voice disorders may have harsh or hoarse voices or voices that are too high or too low or too loud or overly nasal. Most, of, most voice disorders though are harmless and they disappear on their own, but sometimes these voice disorders may require the help of a speech specialist. Some of the signs or symptoms of voice disorders include a harsh or hoarse voice, like I just mentioned. Also having, like I mentioned, that high, or high tone or too low of a tone, speaking too loud or too quietly, or maybe the child's lost their voice entirely. Maybe the child speaks as though they're speaking through a blocked nose or um, as though too much air is coming down through their nose during speech. Let's now take a look at Theory, some theories of intelligence. One theory of intelligence was one that came about by a researcher named Spearman. And what he found was that there were two major factors involved in intelligence. And when we say factors, he actually came up with these factors using a statistical tool that's called factor analysis. He said that there's something called the general intelligence factor. And this is a common ability that underlies intellectual abilities. It's our ability to learn, to reason, and to adapt. And it can be assessed by a variety of tasks. It can include how we are able to perform in quantitative reasoning, fluid reasoning, visual spatial processing, knowledge, and working memory. So it really underlies so many different abilities that we have and how well we're able to do those things. So Spearman noted that while every person tends to excel in some area uh, more so than another, it's not impossible for them to excel in additional areas as well. So he thought that um, it's, it can be common for a person who specializes in one area to do well in other related areas. So for example, let's say we have a person who excelled well on verbal tests, they're likely to do well on other tests too, since many other tests have underneath their measurement some verbal ability that's needed in order to do well. And you might want to think about this as we might think about, let's say, athletes. So there's no guarantee that, let's say, um, someone who's really good at playing soccer would be equally good at snowboarding, but we might say that a good soccer player is fit and athletic. So he or she might have higher chances of performing physical tasks better than individuals who are not as coordinated physically. And specific intelligence is a measure of specific skills in narrow domains. So when we think about intelligence tests, like for example, um, the Stanford Binet, they're thought to measure various cognitive factors that make up general intelligence. So as I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, this can include quantitative reasoning, fluid reasoning, which is a flexible, is that flexible thinking that we have to solve problems, visual spatial processing, knowledge, and working memory. So our overall ability to do well at all of these things collectively, we could think of as general intelligence because there's these underlying abilities beneath all of these collectively or each of these together. Another theory of intelligence that you learned about in your readings is Sternberg's triarchic theory. And Sternberg suggested that intelligence could be, could, could be thought of as using our abilities skillfully to achieve our personal goals. And goals can be short-term, like getting an A on a test, making a snack in a microwave, or winning a 100-meter hurdle, or longer-term, like having a successful career and a happy life. 
And so achieving these goals by using one's skills defines that successful intelligence. So in achieving personal goals, Sternberg suggested that we use three different kinds of abilities. He suggested we use analytical ability or analytical intelligence. And this involves analyzing problems and generating different solutions. So for example, let's say a teenager wants to download songs to her iPhone, but something isn't working. Analytical intelligence is shown when she considers different causes of the problem. Maybe the iPhone is broken, or maybe the software to download songs wasn't installed correctly. Another uh, part of this intelligence is creative intelligence or creative ability. And this involves dealing adaptively with novel situations and problems. So let's say that our 12 year old discovers that her iPhone is broken, the same young uh, teenager, as she's ready to leave with her family on a day long car trip. So she doesn't have the time, she doesn't have the money to buy a new phone. Creative intelligence is shown in dealing successfully with a new goal, maybe finding a new activity to pass the time on a long drive. And then we have what's called practical intelligence. And practical intelligence involves our ability to know what solution or plan will actually work. So as you know, of course, problems can be solved in different ways in principle, but in reality, only one solution may be practical. This same teenager may realize that surfing the internet um, for a way to fix their phone software is the only real choice because her parents wouldn't approve of many of the songs and she doesn't want her siblings to know that she's downloading them anyways. So here we see that application of knowing what solution will actually work, that practical intelligence. And according to Sternberg, true intelligence involves a balance of all three of these. As you read in your textbook, and, and as relates to Sternberg's theory of intelligence, you learned about divergent and convergent thinking. And the type of thinking that's associated with creativity is divergent thinking. Convergent thinking involves focusing on the correct answer or conventional answer. Whereas divergent thinking is, is a type of thinking that involves considering multiple possible solutions. And so you can imagine then why it would be the hallmark of creativity. Table 5.3 in your textbook provides for you some important components of creativity. When we think about creativity, we could think of it as an ability to produce work that's novel and that is task appropriate. Uh, we're going to be looking at creativity throughout the lifespan. We'll look at what happens as people age. I will go ahead and let you know that the research suggests that there is a relationship between age and creativity or the number of contribu creative contributions that a person makes. It tends to peak through one's 30s um, and then or continue through their 30s and then peak in the late 30s and early 40s and then tends to decline thereafter. There are always exceptions. We're not talking about absolute predictive patterns. We're just talking about trends here. So take a look at the important components of creativity in Table 5.3 and ask yourself, what do, where do you stand? Do you do any of these things? Uh, what could you do to improve your creativity? There are many creativity theorists who suggest that creativity is a skill we learn. It's not something that we are born with. Uh, some of you may disagree with that. You may say you're just not a creative person, but I would challenge you to ask yourself um, about what you were like when you were four and five years of age. Did people think you were creative then? Did you do things that were, un, you know, kind of, um, you know, different? Were you did you come up with new ways of doing things? Did you enjoy doing things like drawing or um, solving new problems, playing music? Uh, creativity can be found in any field. And when I think about creativity, I, I wonder um, about the experiences that some children may have had that resulted in them you know, no longer pursuing creative efforts. So perhaps when they were young, they were creative and then something happened. Was it in school where they were maybe discouraged? Was it that they didn't have the opportunities that they had in early childhood? And then I wonder what are we losing as a society if this is actually true, that some children are discouraged 
uh, directly or indirectly from being creative. An important theorist that many of you may have heard of is Howard Gardner. As you read your textbook, you learned that Howard Gardner came up with what's called a multiple theory or theory of multiple intelligences. And instead of relying on test scores as the basis for his theory, Gardner drew on research and child development and studies of brain damaged persons and studies of exceptionally talented people. When he first came up with his theory, which was in the early 1980s, he identified seven distinct intelligences. And then in subsequent work, he identified two additional intelligences. And you can see them listed in your textbook. And so there are nine different types of intelligences. So if you'll notice through looking at these different types of intelligences, we have linguistic intelligence, logical mathematical intelligence, and spatial intelligence. And these tend to be included in the traditional theories of intelligences. The other six intelligences are not, including musical, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, and existential intelligences. These are unique to his theory. So, you know, according to Gardner, we might think about, um, you know, beautiful singing of a, a well-known, um, you know, opera singer or a, a popular musician like Ariana Grande. We might think about musicians. And if we were to apply just simply the traditional theory of intelligence, we might find that they're uh, intelligence would be ignored or think about Oprah Winfrey, you know, think about her grace and her charm and dealing with people and how that propelled her into being the, you know, the, the person that she is today, the very known person and uh, what she's been able to accomplish. If we were to look at that traditional approach to intelligence, she may have been left out at least to some degree. You might wonder, how did Gardner arrive at these nine distinct intelligences? So first, each has a unique developmental history. Linguistic intelligence, for example, develops much earlier than the others. Also, each intelligence is regulated by distinct regions of the brain. So for example, spatial intelligence is regulated by particular regions in the right hemisphere of the brain. And then intelligence has special cases of talented individuals. We might think about well-known instances of musically intelligent people, for example, who maybe exhibit incredible talent at a very early age. Some suggest that this theory of multiple intelligence has important implications for education. Gardner, for example, himself, believes that schools should foster all intelligences. And I would wonder um, what you think. So think about what is your perspective? Do you think that schools should foster all intelligences, not just the traditional linguistic and logical mathematical intelligences? Um, should teachers capitalize on the strongest intelligences of individual children? Um, you know, if that's so, Teachers would need to know a child's profile of intelligence, that child's strength and their weaknesses, perhaps to gear instruction to their strengths. Other students might, you know, benefit from, um, you know, if we're thinking about students who maybe don't, haven't yet found their unique individual strength, might benefit then from having that experience of, um, you know, of having, or having the opportunity to experience multiple opportunities in a variety of settings and situations to, you know, to fuel the development of some of these intelligences so that those areas that are strong can be identified and further strengthened. Now, I want to say that I think it's very important to note that teachers should, you know, they should not gear instruction solely to a child's strongest intelligence, you know, pigeonholing children as numerical learners or spatial learners. Think about that. When that happens, then the child doesn't have the opportunity to develop the uh, intelligences in other areas. Instead, uh, you know, whether it's, let's say, the learning about the signing of the Declaration of Independence or maybe Shakespeare's Hamlet, instruction should try to engage as many different types of intelligences as possible. And so that the typical result is a much richer understanding of the topic by all students. 
I want to point out that if you look at your textbook on table 5-4, you see that eight specific intelligences are listed. There is an additional intelligence that um, you should note as well, and that's called the existential intelligence. And I mentioned this a few moments ago, and that's the ability of the person to see the bigger picture. So when that child is able to see connections between things, to see patterns, to really put things together like a philosopher would, for example, at least at a young level, that is evident of existential intelligence. When measuring intelligence, there are some very important features that intelligence tests need to possess. First, it needs to be reliable. In other words, the results need to be consistent over time. So we would expect, let's say, that a reliable intelligence test would produce an IQ score of, let's say, 115 on one occasion, and then two months later, perhaps 117 or 118. You might say that those are different scores, but you also need to remember that it may be that there's some slight variation that happens for factors that could be unrelated to IQ, like the attention level of the person that day, or perhaps prior experience in taking that test. But we see consistency. And this is something that's measured using statistics. Another measure is what's called validity. And so in other words, the test needs to measure what it intends to measure. In the case of intelligence, it needs to measure intelligence, not something else. So that's why there are so many perspectives on what intelligence is. And if you hold the perspective that intelligence is comprised of these multiple dimensions like Gardner, then you may feel that a traditional IQ test is not as valid a measure as say something that incorporates these other measures of intelligence. Validity is determined in a variety of ways and there are different types of validity. So we could have validity uh, regarding is this measuring what it intends to measure and we could compare the test results that a person has or a group of people have to another known measure of intelligence to see if there's a relationship. We could look at the constructs and that means look at the different things we're measuring on that test and see how does that fare with the research on intelligence. And there is something called predictive validity. And some of you may have learned about this in statistics. And this is the ability of that test to make predictions about something else, some other behavior. Let's say like um, academic performance in school. And I'm not suggesting that there is a relationship or is not. Uh, that's not for discussion at this point. We'll look later at that. But what I am suggesting is that there are certain things that you may be able to predict from one test. And so that's me that measurement is called predictive validity. Tests that measure intelligence also need to be standardized. So in other words, this means it is administered and scored the same way every time. And this is done in addition when you're doing, when you're when you are administering an intelligence test or developing it actually, you create what are called age norms. So you would expect that an eight-year-old would typically be able to do certain things, answer questions, answer certain questions correctly. Uh, versus the typical seven-year-old who may not be able to. And then you would be able to compare a child's scores. Let's say you have an eight-year-old you're testing. You're going to compare how they perform to what uh, you know, what, uh, what your previous research has suggested that children of that age are able to do. And then this can actually, based on that research and then further based upon your um, use of plotting this onto uh, or creating a normal distribution or bell curve based on this information, you can then plot the score on a bell curve. The only way you can plot a score on a bell curve, which is, you know, if we look at a bell curve, we're creating, you know, we're able to identify where do most people tend to fall, where's the average, what's the standard deviation, in other words, the average distance from the mean. And so you're able to plot that and you can then identify where does Jimmy fall? Where does Samantha fall? Uh, you know, are they at, are they within, you know, the typical, um, you know, IQ, the average IQ of 100 plus or minus 15, or are they outside of that? You're comparing apples to apples. 
So if everyone is given an intelligence test in different ways and they're scored differently, you can't plot these scores on a bell curve. You really can't compare Jimmy, who's eight, his score to another eight-year-old score because they haven't been administered or scored in the same way. Their tests haven't. But if we do everything the same, we're comparing apples to apples. So standardization, we're making sure that we are scoring and administering this test the same way every time. And we can plot that information or those scores, I'm sorry, on a normal distribution. So we're comparing apples to apples. Something else you learned about in this chapter is something known as the Flynn effect. And this is where we're seeing over time an increase in scores on intelligence tests. And this could be due to better nutrition, education, and other factors. So a moment ago, I mentioned the term IQ, and you've read in your text about IQ or intelligence quotient. And this is a measure of intelligence that is adjusted for age. So mental age is the age at which a person is performing intellectually. So a mental age uh, is established based upon what children at that age, let's say 10, can typically do. So what the typical 10 year old can do is then through lots of testing identified as a, a mental age of 10. And then we have what's called chronological age, which is the actual age of the person. So let's say that we have a child who is 10. Well, their chronological age is 10. So IQ is our mental age divided by chronological age multiplied by 100. The reason it's multiplied by 100 is simply because if you don't, you end up with decimal points sometimes. And this could be uh, confusing to people who are trying to understand what their IQ score means. So if let's say we have a child whose mental age is 10 and their chronological age is 10, and we multiply that by 100, now we have one, we have 10 divided by 10 times 100, we have a IQ of 100. So an average IQ, and I mentioned this a moment ago, is 100 plus or minus 15. The reason it's plus or minus 15 is because there is, there's an average distance from the mean. People aren't exactly 100 if they're average. Uh, there's always a little bit of variation around that. So, and so we have what's called a standard deviation. So 100 plus or minus 15, the, a lot, you know, around 68% of the population fall within that range. So most modern intelligence tests are based on the relative position of a person's score among people of the same age and they're not using this formula. This was a formula that was uh, developed by uh, a French uh, math or a French researcher whose name was Alfred Binet and another one named Simon who were trying to come up with a way of recognizing children who would have some struggles in school uh, without extra special instruction. And so they, um, Binet and Simon selected simple tasks that French children of different ages ought to be able to do, like naming colors, counting backwards, remembering numbers in order. And based on preliminary testing, they identified problems that, let's say in this instance, where I'm describing those types of abilities, a typical three-year-old could solve, and then what a typical four-year-old could solve, and then this became mental age. And so, um, you know, you've got here, uh, an, and by the way, this was back in, um, you know, in the early 1900s when this happened. So that was an early way of thinking about intelligence or calculating IQ. Today, most modern intelligence tests actually plot a person's score on a normal distribution. For those of you who have taken statistics, you could actually convert a person's score into a what's called a z-score, and you can then plot it on a normal distribution to figure out where do they stand in comparison to other children of their age. If you look here, you'll see what I'm talking about, this normal distribution. So a normal distribution, most scores fall at the middle, fewer are at the extremes. This is figure 513 in your textbook. And so the, a normal distribution has some basic statistical properties. And so you'll see here, it says about 68% of people fall in this range. 
I, when I said 68%, it's not because I have a really good memory and remember 68% are between 85 and 115. It's because I remember a rule in statistics that I learned many years ago called the 68-95-99-7 rule. And this basically says that 68% of the population, when we plot things onto a bell curve, fall within one standard of the deviation of a, um, one standard deviation of the mean. And 95% of a population falls within two standard deviations. And 99.7% fall within three standard deviations. And based on knowing this, for those of you who've taken statistics, you can then identify the percentage of different, um, you know, of, of segments of the population that have certain scores. You'll notice here that if we look at IQ, the extreme range is uh, up at 130 and above. The higher we get, the more um, infrequently it occurs. 145 and above is considered genius. There's actually a society for geniuses called Mensa. You can do a search for their um, website, and I think it may just be mensa.org, and they have some questions on there that you can try to solve. And apparently, if you can solve them within so many minutes, they suggest that you might want to get an IQ test because you might have a uh, an IQ that would fall at 145 and above, and you may qualify as a member of their organization, which would be kind of nice to be able to put on your CV or resume. And then you'll notice here, if you look on the other side, the left side of the bell curve, you'll see that 2% of the population falls at 70 and below. And so in most uh, states and most school districts, uh, for for children who are um, considered to have an intellectual disability, we're not talking about learning disabilities, that's completely separate. An intellectual disability, their IQ, and for them to receive funding, that school to receive funding for that student, they need to have a score of 70 or below. Uh, I remember hearing not too long ago about one school district that uh, it's not, it is in Tennessee, but it's not near us, that had changed the criteria to 69 and below. And they did this likely because this meant that they didn't have to spend um, the money on, uh, in, on interventions for those children who were at 70. And so it reduced the spending needed in education. And federal law, uh, indicate, federal law compels uh, compel schools to provide education to children regardless of their, um, you know, ability. So that, um, you know, if, if you are a, if you're, if you have an IQ that is, you know, 70, you probably need those interventions. And if that school's saying 69, you're not going to then qualify for those interventions. And so that's a, that's pretty, um, that, that could be pretty significant for that child. Low IQ scores alone are not sufficient to determine intellectual disability. Um, and so there, you know, with intellectual disability, there's a general delay in the development of intellectual and social skills. So generally speaking, a person with intellectual disability has an IQ score of about 70 or below and, and significant difficulty coping with tasks that are appropriate to his or her age or life situation. Uh, the kinds of educational um, and support services needed by children with intellectual disability depend to a large extent on the severity of the intellectual deficits. So there are variations in the level of intellectual disability. About 1% of the population could be considered as meeting these criteria. And it's caused by both, it can be caused by both genetic and environmental factors. Biological factors can include genetic or chromosomal disorders, brain damage, and exposure to lead. The most common environmental cause is a deprived family environment, one where there's uh, they're lacking in verbal interactions between the child and the parents and lacking in intellectually stimulating play activities. People who are at the upper end of the IQ spectrum, typically about 130 or higher, are generally classified as intellectually gifted. As children, they can benefit from enriched educational programs that allow them to progress at a faster pace than standard programs. 
So today, this concept of giftedness includes not only children with high IQ, but also can include those with special talents. So here we're seeing Gardner's theory influence this. Uh, these special talents can be in areas of music or artistic ability. So these are skills not typically assessed by standard IQ tests. Gifted children may play musical instruments as well as highly trained adults or maybe solve algebra problems at an age when their peers haven't yet learned to carry numbers in addition. It's of course very known that parental involvement is important in middle and late childhood, just as it was in early childhood. This is not always easy though. Sometimes there can be conflicts with work hours or transportation issues so that a parent may want to meet with a teacher but isn't able to because her av availability or his availability conflicts with the parent's work hours. Or it may be that there are issues related to transportation that make it difficult for that parent to go to the school. Of course, we now are seeing a lot of Zoom being used in classrooms, so this may open up some doors. But then we also have to think about access to internet. Not every family has easy access to internet. So if that becomes an option in which it has, but if that, um, you know, if let's say when children return to school and, um, you know, families are not able to, to, to identify alternative opportunities to have internet access that maybe they were during the pandemic, then, you know, we're back to the parent having difficulty with their communi with the communication with the teacher. I think it's also important to note too that uh, the research suggests that teachers are most receptive to parents who are similar to them. And so when we think about the importance of diversity in schools, it's not only beneficial to the child directly, it's beneficial to diverse families. And then there's also family capital. And this is the power that can be used to improve a child's education. And this varies from family to family. Think about um, the influence that some families have over their child's education over some other families. Think about um, access to tutoring, access to additional support, access to higher quality schools. It's also important to note too that cultural differences can affect classroom behavior and performance. So for some children, they, especially if they are moving there, you know, newly here in the United States, and if they have come from a culture where, uh, you know, children are not uh, to be asking questions, they need to just listen, then they, they're not going to be asking questions likely in that classroom, and that can be misinterpreted by the teacher as a lack of interest. Also, very unfortunately, sometimes when children come to uh, the United States and don't speak English very well, uh, there can be assumptions made about a child's uh, intellectual ability when there is zero connection between their language and intellectual ability. And then this then could become a self-fulfilling prophecy where perhaps the teacher isn't giving that child the same challenging opportunities that they might give others. And it's certainly not intentional. It's just based upon these uh, perhaps implicit biases that, uh, that, that some teachers may have. So they come in with very good will, but then some of these, uh, you know, the, the beliefs that they may hold can impact their, their thinking about that student and then their behavior. Also, um, you know, I think a good example also may be of, um, you know, the level of independence that some children may have in the classroom. Our culture is very individualistic, so we would we see a lot of independence expected of children in the classroom. If a child's coming from a collectivistic culture, we're going to see different behaviors from a child than we from that culture than we would an individualistic culture where that child is going to be more focused on interdependence, perhaps on working with others, um, perhaps on relying on others and then others relying on them. So these are these are just a couple of things to think about. And um, clearly there are many other things to think about, but just food for thought to think about how cultural differences can affect behavior and performance and that interrelationship between the teacher and the child and expectations and cultural background, how that plays out. There are three major types of learning disabilities that are most common. And these include difficulties in reading individual words. And this sometimes is known as developmental dyslexia. 
Uh, another is difficulty understanding the words that have been read successfully. And this is uh, could be called impaired reading comprehension. And then another is difficulties in mathematics. And this is uh, termed a mathematical learning disability or developmental dyscalculia. So understanding learning disability has is complicated because each type has its own causes and then requires its own treatment. So the most common, for example, type of learning disability is developmental dyslexia. And um, it's so common that sometimes people will just say it's a reading disability. And many of the children who have this learning disability have problems distinguishing sounds in written or oral language. So for example, um, you know, a child may have, you know, as you're pronouncing a word um, and, you know, you're saying you're saying the word to them, they may not hear some of the individual units or individual sounds within that word as a typical child would, or they're not processing it. They can hear it. Their ears are, their auditory system is working well, but they're not processing that language. Um, and so, you know, or it may be a child has trouble distinguishing bis from bep or bis from dis. And so they're, these sound very similar and there's, tr there's difficulty in processing. There are different degrees of dyslexia. So some children have very mild symptoms, whereas some other have very um, significant symptoms. Children who have developmental dyslexia, they typically benefit from uh, training in what's called phonological awareness. And this is this helps them to identify subtle but important differences in language sounds. And then also um, what's called explicit instruction on the connections between letters and their sounds. And with intensive instruction of this type, children who have dyslexia can read more effectively. So another one I mentioned, another type of disability is uh, impaired reading comprehension. So these children have no trouble reading words, but they understand far less of what they read. And remember, this is not because of something, you know, like having inadequate instruction. There's likely something going on neurologically for this child. So maybe they're asked to read a sentence like, the man rode the bus to go to work, or the dog chased the cat through the woods. And so they might find it difficult to answer questions about what they've read, like, what did the man ride? Or where did the man go? And so this could be, um, you know, um, this, as you could imagine, this could be significant for a child who has uh, this type of disability. As when we think about um, a child who can read, uh, you know, typically we want children to be able to read by the time they enter, you know, finish second grade because they're learning to read up to second grade through second grade. And then in third grade, they're reading to learn. So you can think about when this is going to start to affect the child. A parent may not notice that the child has this learning disability until they're moving forward in their in their learning um, in learning to read. So it may be not may not be until second grade or even third grade or later as there's trouble um, or challenges with comprehension. And then, as I mentioned, there's another most uh, another common learning disability that's called um, a mathematical disability, and that also I, I mentioned is dyscalculia. And so, um, you know, a lot of kids will struggle with math in the very beginning and they progress, you know, many, you know, some kids will struggle and then they progress as typical kids do and end up faring well with their other classmates. They end up being, um, you know, being okay in their math, but then some kids continue to have uh, this difficulty. And what they're struggling with is they can struggle with counting or adding and subtracting. And sometimes these children will also be diagnosed with a, a reading disability. As children get older and they're moving into second and third grade and later, they may use inefficient methods for computing solutions. So maybe they're still using their fingers as third graders to solve problems like nine plus seven. So um, there's not as much known about um, mathematical uh, learning disability than reading disabilities. And this is because math, math engages a broader set of, still, of skills. And there, but there are some, uh, some, some ideas about what might be causing this. One is that, um, you know, the, you know, it may be that children who 
that they may have issues with what's called an approximate number system. So they get less precise estimates of quantities um, from children who have a learning, who have a mathematical learning disability. Another possible cause is that uh, these children may be impaired in counting or retrieving math facts from memory. And then some other theorists suggest that it may reflect a problem in the basic cognitive processes that are used during math, like in working memory or in executive functions. So since, since mathematical disability isn't that well understood, effective interventions, you know, they're not as developed and tried and practiced as those for reading disabilities, but they are available. And as more research emerges, so too will the development of, uh, of these interventions. I think it's important to note that uh, when children have these learning disabilities, it can reflect and of course their academic performance so that a child can have average or high IQ, but is going to struggle in say, uh, you know, comprehending what they're reading. And so, you know, if they have a comprehension, if they have a, a learning disability related to comprehension, then of course, they're not going to do as well on test questions that are asking them about what they've read. Or if a child has a reading disability, not only might they struggle in reading and in literacy, they're going to struggle in doing word problems, or they're going to struggle as they're reading about science and as they're reading in social studies. And I think it's also important to note that not all learning problems are learning disabilities. There can also be sensory and motor impairments. Sometimes learning problems are, and those are very different from learning disabilities, can be due to language barriers or intellectual disability. And it's important to be able to distinguish between each of these and learning disabilities. Another type of learning disability that is described in your textbook is dysgraphia. And this is a writing disability, and this affects the legibility of the writing, and it also um, can affect the way that words are written. And this is often associated with dyslexia. Please be sure to take a look at each of these in your textbook so that you can identify the overall symptoms. Let's take some time to review attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. When we think about this disorder, we may reflect on classrooms that have children of varying levels of energy and abilities to focus. Some children are chronically restless, impulsive, and distractible. And when we think about ADHD, we tend to think about three defining symptoms, and this includes hyperactivity, inattention, and impulsivity. Children who have ADHD are unusually energetic, fidgety, and unable to keep still, especially you know, in situations that are requiring them to limit their activity, like in reading. And so we call this hyperactivity. Then some children uh, may also exhibit a significant amount of difficulty in focusing. So there is trouble with attention. They exhibit inattention. They, don't, they may have trouble paying attention in class and seem unable to concentrate on schoolwork and maybe skip from one task to another. Another characteristic is impulsivity. And so children with ADHD may act out before thinking. They may run into a street before looking for traffic or interrupt others while they're speaking. I think it's important to note that not all children with ADHD are all the same. Some children with ADHD have uh, you know, our pr the primary symptom is hyperactivity. For other children, their primary symptom may be impulsivity. And for some other children, there may be an interaction or there may be, I should say, both happening of hyperactivity and impulsivity at heightened levels. Whatever pr the primary symptoms are, that may affect, affect the initial course of treatment that a doctor may, may, tr may um, try with the child. As you can imagine, ADHD can be associated with academic and social challenges. There are a variety of potential causes for ADHD or of ADHD, and I think it's important to note that understanding the causes is not only important because it leads to it can lead to effective treatment, but understanding the causes is important because of how often it happens. 
Uh, we should under it's not, it would be wonderful to understand the causes of all disorders, but when we have a disorder that is affecting so many children, understanding the reasons can really be helpful in um, helping many families and children. In the U.S., about six percent of children in school are diagnosed with ADHD. Boys tend they outnumber girls by a three to one ratio. The diagnosis is most commonly made in middle childhood when it becomes obvious that the child has trouble working alone in a classroom. Sometimes these children may have uh, trouble making friends, not always, but sometimes, and they may be disruptive at home. So when we're seeing this behavior happening in more than one environment, this can be an indicator that it's not the environment that's the issue, and it may to some degree be, but it's if it's crossing different environments, there's something else likely going on. So when it is diagnosed in children, often a, uh, a the doctor will ask a parent to, to fill out a questionnaire, but will also ask the parent to give the teacher an opportunity to fill out a questionnaire that's specific to the classroom so that they can look for uh, you know, the, for what's, you know, if there's similarities or similar symptoms across situations. And when we think about the interventions that are used for ADHD, it is important to get a correct diagnosis. Children who have ADHD not only benefit from behavioral interventions, but they can benefit from biomedical interventions. And this often includes the use of stimulants. And they, the stimulants are a controlled substance and they should not be administered lightly. And so doctors are cautious in, in, in diagnosing ADHD and in how they go about uh, prescribing ADHD medications. I think it's important to note too that while this is in the segment of your textbook that is in middle childhood, the symptoms of ADHD can begin to show up earlier. So some children who are, uh, you know, five and six years of age may begin showing some symptoms of ADHD, although it can be difficult at that point to necessarily know if this is uh, related to, uh, you know, maybe in uh, their just overall development. Sometimes it could be that if they're going to school and the expectations are that, you know, they're five and they're being asked to sit still all day, this is, this is difficult for any five-year-old. And so to diagnose that child just based on that would not be, uh, it may not be an accurate diagnosis. And so physicians are very cautious in diagnosing very early. But that is something between the parent and the um, and the pediatrician or psychiatrist. Those are, you know, decisions that they will be making together, and uh, you know, so that the child can get the most appropriate treatment and intervention. There are some genes that seem to put children at risk for developing ADHD, and this may be, you know, these genes may be affecting the alerting or executive networks of attention and the brain structures that support these networks. There are also environmental factors that can contribute. Sometimes prenatal exposure to alcohol or other drugs put a child at risk. Uh, a parent who, a mother who when she was pregnant did not have uh, you know, proper nutrition. Children who are born premature are, uh, are very susceptible uh, to the development of ADHD. And so as I mentioned, it is important to understand the causes. There are more causes than what I just mentioned here. There are ex there's extensive research in this area and it's, it's very interesting research. I want to point out too that there are there have been six regions of the brain that have been identified in brain imaging that are distinct in many children with ADHD versus those who do not have it. So when you hear people say things like ADHD or a diagnosis of this is just an excuse for, um, you know, it's, it's just a, something we call, you know, maybe, uh, you know, instead of calling a child someone who's out of control or misbehaving, we call them, you know, we say they have ADHD. This is not an excuse. It is not a made up diagnosis. It is real. And there are physical markers in the brain and believed to be genetic contributions to that. Also, you see that ADHD can run in families. ADHD sometimes can go untreated for years, and it's not until adulthood that a person is diagnosed. So uh, I would encourage each of you to do further reading about this so that you can understand it since the symptoms are, you know, since the diagnosis happens in 6% of children. And there are also many adults who were never diagnosed whose lives may be affected now.
Let's take a look at relevant legislation related to children with disabilities. Let's first take a look at the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was signed into law in 1990 under George W. Bush. This is one of America's most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate in the mainstream of American life, to enjoy employment opportunities, to purchase goods and services, and to participate in state and local government programs and services, including education. It was modeled after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and it is an equal opportunity law for people with disabilities. To be protected under this law, one must have a disability, which is defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And a person who has a history or record of such impairment, or a person who is perceived, who is perceived by others as having an impairment. This act does not list all of the impairments that are covered. For more information, I would encourage you to visit uh, your government website. So that is particularly relevant to education. Let's take a look at the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This act ensures that all children with disabilities are entitled to a free, appropriate public education to meet their unique needs and to prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. Prior to this act, uh, there were over 4 million children with disabilities who were denied appropriate access to public education. Many children were denied e entry into public school altogether, and others were placed in segregated classrooms or in regular classrooms, but without adequate support for their special needs. There are some distinct sections to the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, and so I would encourage you to take a look at this act on uh, one of your government websites. I'm not going to go over all of the details of this for you, but it is very important for you to be aware of uh, because it is the law. And so the overarching, um, over, some overarching things that, are, that fall underneath this are free, appropriate public education up to age 21, fair evaluation of performance, a least restrictive environment, and an individualized education program. So when we think about IEPs, if you've ever heard of that, that's what we're referring to. So what have you learned in this video? You've learned about Piaget's concrete operational stage of thinking and the characteristics of concrete thinking. You also learned about memory, attention, metacognition, and critical thinking during this stage of development. You learned about language development and the three types of communication disorders. You learned about some important theories of intelligence. And I hope that you had an opportunity to think about which of Gardner's multiple intelligences your strengths lie within. You also learned about how intelligence is measured. And you learned about the extremes in intelligence and the concern for bias. You learned about language and culture and how these influence the typical classroom. And you learned about common disabilities in childhood and the legislation that protects them educationally. So what will you be learning about next? Next, you're going to be learning about Erickson's fourth stage of psychosocial development that he calls industry versus inferiority. And I'd encourage you as you learn about this stage to think about yourself and how you progress through that stage and how potentially it has affected you today. You'll also learn about the changes in self-concept and self-esteem and self-efficacy. You'll learn also about Kohlberg's stages of moral development. And as you learn about that theory of moral development, I'd encourage you to think about your own moral development and where you are in these stages. You're going to learn too about the importance of peers during this stage. You'll learn about peer acceptance, and you'll also learn about bullying and cyberbullying and some of the consequences of bullying. You'll learn too about the different types of families where children reside and the consequences of divorce on children. As always, if you have any questions as you're reading or after watching this video or just reflecting on what you've learned, please don't hesitate to let me know. 
Until then, I look forward to seeing each of you online.